Welcome. This module is on how the PEP1T model can be applied to environmental aspects. The aim of this module is to offer you an overview of most aspects of 1. Why accounting for interactions between the economy and the environment is a promising line of research for CGE modeling. 2. The types of data needed to apply the PEP1T model to environmental aspects. And from a more practical point of view, 3. What types of environmental applications can be considered for the standard PEP1T model? By successfully engaging with this module, we hope you'll be able to 1. Formulate an environmental question that can be answered within the PEP1T framework. 2. Identify the data sets and approaches for using the PEP1T model with environmental topics. 3. Understand how to modify the standard structure of the PEP1T model to better incorporate such environmental dimensions. The first question addressed in this module is why including environmental features in the PEP1T model might be relevant. In economic literature, there is a growing consensus that the environment plays a fundamental role in determining a nation's wealth. It forms part of the four core stocks of capital on which this wealth is supposed to be grounded along with economic capital, human capital, and social capital. By comprising many assets such as land, water, soil, timber, fish stocks, etc., it is often said that the environment provides the natural capital for the economy. This natural capital interacts with the economy by delivering essential goods and services for agents and by absorbing emissions and wastes generated by the economic activity. However, this natural capital is both limited and vulnerable. Stocks of natural assets can be renewable if managed sustainably, but they can also be depleted or degraded if mismanaged with potentially detrimental impacts on the well-being of current and future generations. Given that replacing natural capital with other forms of capital is often impossible or carries significant risks, it is generally considered that the environment sets an ecological boundary for the socio-economic system. Despite the fundamental role that natural capital plays in determining a country's economic wealth, it is largely ignored in the PEP-T model. As a CGE analysis, the PEP-T model relies mainly on the standard metrics of economic performances provided by the System of National Accounts of the United Nations. The SNA's concepts define the production boundary of the economy. However, they are limited and ultimately poor indicators of sustainable development, or more generally, well-being. For one, they do not account for flows that fall outside the production boundary of the economy, such as the ability of natural capital to provide ecosystem services that are non-marketed. For another, SNA's concepts also ignore the cost of the depletion or degradation of environmental resources. Yet not accounting for the natural capital has strong consequences. It leads to wrong measures of the real wealth of nations and pervades decision-making at all scales, from the microeconomic level, for instance via market prices that fail to reflect a product's full costs and benefits, up to the macroeconomic level, for instance, in excluding environmental values from policy trade-offs. In fact, in its basic structure, PEP1T has very little to say about environmental aspects. The sole natural resource that is included is land, which is sometimes considered as a production factor for some economic activities, like the agricultural sector. However, it is in a very basic representation, which only allows consideration of productivity or scarcity of land. Using the standard PEP1T model for environmental issues requires them to be modeled explicitly. In some works, topics of ecosystem services delivery are sometimes addressed by including water activities or energy activities in the supply side of the economy. Climate change impacts are also sometimes addressed by including some negative externalities in the model as shown in the capsule modeling the impacts of climate change on agriculture in PEP1T. Climate policy issues are sometimes included through specific taxes or new markets, as it is shown in the capsule Climate Change and Carbon Pricing. Such approaches are limited, however, given the lack of a full representation of environmental-economic interactions in the standard PEP1T framework, 
and the strong assumptions often required for environmental data reconciliation with economic data of the social accounting matrix. In this context, many benefits might be expected from applying the PEP1T model to environmental topics. First, as a Walrassian model, PEP1T might allow us to include the natural capital as a limited asset contributing to income generation and economic growth. It might also allow us to address the question of the value of this natural capital into the decision-making of economic agents and to account for price-induced substitutions for environmental resources-related flows. Second, as a multi-sectoral model, PEP1T might also help to pay special attention to the allocation of natural assets and ecosystem services across different economic agents, both from the supply side of the economy as production factors, for instance agricultural land, fish stocks, etc., and from the demand side as products used for intermediate or final consumption, for instance water, energy, etc. Third, as an economy-wide model, PEP1T might be a potentially powerful tool for addressing the complex economic and environmental-wide interactions as well as the effects of environmental policies with wide-ranging impacts. Finally, as a dynamic simulation model, PEP1T might facilitate an understanding of the ways a country might change its course towards sustainable development pathways and might facilitate a better evaluation of the potential impacts of environmental policies as well as the consequences of inaction. In economic literature, these environmental topics are usually addressed in the field of environmental and resources economics. Better accounting for the environment in PEP1T could help to join this research field as well as a growing number of policy agendas. For instance, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which integrate the natural capital, the society, and the economy, and recognizes that they cannot be managed separately. Or the Green Economy Field, which aims for sustainable development without eroding the environment. Or the Beyond GDP Initiative of the OECD, which aims to develop indicators more inclusive of environmental and social aspects of progress, and many others. Any environmental extension of the PEP1T model implies the need to collect new data in order to build an environmentally extended SAM. The second question addressed in this module is to show where such types of data can be found and how they can be used. The central framework forms the basic structure of the SEEA accounts and comprises three main types of accounts. First, the accounts for environmental flows measure flows of natural inputs, products, and residuals between the environment and the economy and within the economy, both in physical and monetary terms. Second, the accounts for stocks of environmental assets, such as water or energy, measure the levels of these assets and their variations due to economic activity and natural processes, both in physical and monetary terms. Third, the accounts for economic activity related to the environment measures monetary flows, including spending on environmental protection and resource management, and the production of environmental goods and services. It should be noted that these accounts explicitly identify environmental transactions already existing in the SNA. Six main specific accounts are developed using the structures and principles laid out in the SEEA Central Framework. Such topics are agriculture, forestry and fisheries, energy, water, air emissions, land and material flows. In complement to the central framework, the UN also developed the SEEA Ecosystem Accounting for organizing data about ecosystem assets, measuring the ecosystem services and linking this information to economic and other human activity. This system of environmental economic accounting is an international framework However, it is sufficiently flexible to be adapted to each country's priorities. As shown in the map, many countries now implement such types of environmental accounts, therefore increasing the availability of consistent information for extending macroeconomic analyses with environmental data. The central framework forms the basic structure of the SEEA accounts and comprises three main types of accounts. First, the accounts for environmental flows measure flows of natural inputs, products, and residuals 
between the environment and the economy and within the economy, both in physical and monetary terms. Second, the accounts for stocks of environmental assets, such as water or energy, measure the levels of these assets and their variations due to economic activity and natural processes, both in physical and monetary terms. Third, the accounts for economic activity related to the environment measures monetary flows, including spending on environmental protection and resource management, and the production of environmental goods and services. It should be noted that these accounts explicitly identify environmental transactions already existing in the SNA. Six main specific accounts are developed using the structures and principles laid out in the SEEA Central Framework. Such topics are agriculture, forestry and fisheries, energy, water, air emissions, land and material flows. In complement to the central framework, the UN also developed the SEEA Ecosystem Accounting for organizing data about ecosystem assets, measuring the ecosystem services, and linking this information to economic and other human activity. The SEEA accounts themselves are made up of two main types of tables. The first tables are the supply and use tables, which account for the different flows between the economy and the environment. They can be used to assess how an economy supplies and uses energy, water, and materials, as well as to examine changes in production and consumption patterns over time. The simplified table presented here only provides an introduction of such supply and use tables as there is a wide range of elements that could be added to cover all relevant flows. Compared to conventional supply and use tables, the SEEA supply and use tables incorporate an additional column for the environment and two additional rows for natural inputs and residuals. Natural inputs are all the physical inputs that are moved from their location in the environment as part of an economic production processes. They can be natural resource inputs like mineral or water resources, inputs of energy or other natural inputs, for instance nutrients or oxygen. Residuals are flows of solids, liquids, and gaseous materials, and energy that is discarded or emitted by economic agents through their processes of production, consumption, or accumulation. Within this framework, a supply and use table represents the physical and monetary flows of natural inputs, products, and residuals between the different economic units. Overall, the total supply of each category of product must equal the total use of this product. Gray cells are null by definition. Yellow cells contain flows already included in the conventional supply and use table of the SNA. And blue cells account for economic and environmental interactions. The second table presented in the SEEA central framework is the environmental asset accounts. This records the opening and closing of stocks of environmental assets and the different causes of changes in these stocks in physical and monetary terms. One main purpose of these accounts is to assess whether current patterns of economic activity are depleting or degrading the available environmental assets. As shown in the simplified table presented here, there are many reasons for changes in the quantity and value of a stock of environmental assets over an accounting period. Many of these changes are due to interactions between the economy and the environment, for example, the extraction of minerals or the planting of timber resources, other changes can be caused by natural phenomena, for example, natural deaths of biological resources or forest fires. Other changes are more accounting related in nature and comprise reappraisals and reclassifications of assets. Based on the SEEA data, it is possible to build an environmentally extended social accounting matrix for the PEP1T model. This environmentally extended SAM should combine information from the standard social accounting matrix in monetary units and information on environmental flows or natural capital stocks that are measured in physical units or monetary units. There are various ways in which this new SAM can be constructed depending on each researcher's needs and on the information available in the SCEE accounts. However, the basic logic is to add accounts for the environment as a source of natural capital and environmental service flows and as a sink for byproducts, waste or emissions generated through economic activity. 
The environmentally extended SAM presented here is a simplified framework. Therefore, it does not include all the details that could be included in an environmental extension of the PEP1T model. In this SAM, the natural capital represents the environment. It can be desegregated given the purpose of each study in available data, for instance land, water, soil, etc. Values are expressed in stocks, either in physical or monetary terms, depending on the type of assets. Resources are natural inputs, such as mineral and energy resources, water, soil, and biological resources, etc. They are obtained directly from the environment. In some cases, for instance, the registered water, they can also be supplied by an industry or imported from the rest of the world. These resources flow mainly from the environment into the economy. They are used in various ways by national economic agents for final consumption, intermediate consumption, or as factors of production, or are exported to the rest of the world. Residuals are flows of materials and energy, waste, byproduct, emissions to the air, etc., that are discharged or emitted by economic agents or imported from the rest of the world. They can be used as intermediate inputs by economic activities or absorbed by the environment. Now it is time to address the last question of this module, how the PEP1T model can be extended in order to include some interactions between the environment and the economy. The first environmental topic that we chose to focus on in this module is on energy. It should be noted that some energy issues can also be found in the climate change and carbon pricing capsule. There are many reasons for including the topic of energy in the PEP1T model. Whatever the country, energy plays a critical role both in the economy and in the environment. On the one hand, continuing welfare and development are dependent upon the benefits to be derived from energy use. On the other hand, the use of energy by economic agents imposes a broad range of pressures on the physical environment, such as depletion of non-renewable sources and environmental degradation arising from energy-related emissions. In this context, energy is intimately linked with sustainable development, and it appears more and more necessary for countries to move away from a sectoral management of energy to an integrated overall approach for defining its energy policy. These energy-related policy choices are numerous. They can affect technology choices, such as the nature of investments that might be designed to prevent or reduce pollution or lead to more efficient use of energy. They can also affect fiscal choices, such as the energy-specific taxes and subsidies that might be implemented to incite economic agents to use more environmentally friendly energy. In the context of climate change, these issues are particularly important. When applying the PEP1T model to energy topics, the first choice is to consider energy as a product used by economic agents. Different energy sectors produce various energy goods from different energy sources, like oil, natural gas, coal, uranium, etc. These energy goods are demanded by economic agents for their intermediate and final consumption. Specific data on these supplies and uses of energy can be easily found in the SEEA energy accounts. For any user, it can be relevant to consider that energy consists of a composite good reflecting the imperfect substitutability between the different sources of energy. In order to include this hypothesis in the demand side of the economy, CES specifications must be added in the PEP1T model. Here, equation 1 shows that economic activities use different energy goods as intermediary products. Equation 2 shows that the demand of each type of energy good derives from the first-order conditions of cost minimization. Within this framework, any economic agent using energy chooses its energy composition so as to minimize its costs. Their final choice depends on the relative prices of the different energy goods and on the degrees of substitution between them. At this stage, it should also be noted that specific taxes or subsidies on energy goods, uses, or production can be included in accounting for environmental policy issues. In most cases, the specific industries that produce energy goods use a non-renewable resource as an input, like fossil energy. 
In PEP1T, it can be relevant to account for this adverse pressure on the physical environment and to consider the use of energy as a source of depletion of natural resources. For instance, in the first equation presented here, the level of physical depletion of the natural resource for a given period T can be directly linked to each energy sector output. And the second equation considers the evolution of stock between two periods of the remaining resource. It should be noted at this stage that technical parameters in equation 1 and stocks of natural resource in equation 2 can be easily deduced from the SEEA energy data, which provides valuable information on energy resource availabilities and on quantities of resource extractions. The third modeling choice for applying the PEP1T model to energy topics is to consider the use of energy as a source of degradation for the environment. Among the many adverse outcomes that energy use can generate on the environment, air emissions are one of the most important sources of degradation with potentially strong negative consequences on global warming and on ecosystems. Therefore, it can be relevant to include such negative environmental impacts. For instance, in the equation shown here, we consider that the consumption of each type of energy product by a sector contributes to general proportional air emissions. The same assumption can also be made for households' final consumption. The technical parameters in Equation 1 can be easily calibrated by using SEEA air emissions accounts. Different types of emissions can then be considered depending on the purpose of the study, for example, carbon or sulfur dioxide emissions. Moreover, it can also be relevant to extend the analysis to include a consideration of the factors underlying the energy-related emissions, as, for example, some technological change or some regulations such as taxes on pollution or emission permits. The second topic that we choose to focus on in this module is water. There are many reasons for including this topic in the PEP1T model. Water is a resource provided by the environment that is crucial for some activities for production, such as agricultural activities, but also for households' final consumption. However, water resources are often scarce, and with climate change, they are projected to reduce significantly in most subtropical regions. In this context, many countries might experience conditions of water stress and an increase in competition for fresh water among different users. These issues are addressed in the capsule Modeling the Impacts of Climate Change on Agriculture in PEP1T. For this reason, incorporating water supply and use in the PEP1T model could be relevant. It could help policymakers with making decisions about which economic instruments to put into place for better allocation of water resources among the different users, changing the behavior of users or encouraging the efficiency of water supply and reuse of water. To apply the PEP1T model to water topics, it should be considered that water is a product used by economic activities in their production processes. Specific data can be found in SEEA water accounts, which record the hydrological system of a country and its links to the economy. In a majority of cases, water can be considered as an input provided by a water industry. In that case, water is a marketed intermediary good that can be easily included in the standard PEP1T model in each production function through a Leontiev technology specification. However, for agricultural activities and for the water industry, water can be considered as a non-marketed factor of production, coming from rain or direct groundwater extraction. In that case, one major challenge is that the parameter determining the marginal productivity of water in the production functions cannot be estimated through calibration. It is not possible to couple a factor of production having a virtual zero price with CES production functions where marginal productivity never goes to zero. In order to overcome this shortcoming, water can be considered as an implicit factor of production for agricultural activities, affecting its total factor productivity. Within this framework, water is a hidden factor which is not explicitly modeled. It is rather embedded inside the value of agricultural capital already included in Equation 3 of the standard PEP1T model. 
Here, this factor does not have an explicit price, but its variations are supposed to influence the total factor productivity of the activity that uses it. As shown in the equation presented here, changes in water availability are thus passed on in the PEP1T model through exogenous changes in productivity. This productivity effect can differ given the type of agriculture considered. For the rain-fed agriculture, it can be supposed to depend directly on precipitation and must be initially estimated using agronomic studies. For irrigated agriculture, this direct relationship does not hold, considering that the capital devoted to irrigation moderates the impact of precipitation changes. Therefore, the productivity effect will often be estimated using hydrological studies representing the flow used for irrigation as a function of changes in precipitation, river flow, temperatures, evapotranspiration, and the evolution of a reservoir's capacities. Within this framework, the PEP1T model can now be used to evaluate the consequences of future changes in water availability for economic agents. In designing the simulation scenarios over a given period, we can use the projections from the hydrological or climatic models of available surface and groundwater or precipitations. However, instead of assuming exogenous changes of water resources stocks, it can also be useful to better consider the evolution of these stocks in the PEP1T model. At a given time t, the water availability for economic activities depends indeed on natural recharges, for instance coming from the rain but also on the water demand from all economic agents and on discharges by the economy into the environment. Specific data about these flows can be found in the SEEA water accounts. By accounting for these evolutions of physical stocks of water between two periods, some equations can be added in the PEP1T, as shown in the equation presented here. At this stage, using the SEEA water classifications, it can be relevant to distinguish different types of water resources such as surface water, groundwater, soil water, or other. Within this framework, PEP1T can now help to identify critical issues about water availability. It could be, for instance, the identification of, of potential water stress risks, but also the evaluation of the specific contribution of each economic activity to the pressure on water resources and the options for reducing that pressure. It could also be an opportunity for improving water allocation. One last water topic that could be useful to include in the PEP1T model is about water quality. Emissions that are produced by economic activity and that reduce the quality of water constitute a major environmental problem. This topic is included in the SEEA water accounts where specific emission accounts describe the flows of different pollutants which are a result of production and consumption by economic agents and which flow into water resources directly or indirectly through the sewage network. Some equations can be added in the standard PEP1T models in order to account for this deterioration of water quality. Given that pollution is generally measured in volume in SEEA accounts, the equation presented here is expressed in physical terms at this stage, it should also be noted that different types of pollutants should be considered. Within this framework, the PEP1T model could now help to measure the pressure on the environment caused by an economic activity by focusing on agents responsible for these emissions. It could become a useful tool for policymakers for designing economic instruments, such as specific taxes or emission permits, aimed at reducing or controlling such emissions into the water. The third topic that we choose to focus on in this module is about non-renewable resources. Including such topics in an environmentally extended PEP1T model could be of great interest because, in many countries, non-renewable resources often offer high potential for achieving developmental goals. However, without effective management, these sources of wealth can be easily squandered. Moreover, in some cases, reducing the reliance on non-renewable resources and expanding renewable resource uses can be one key to a sustainable development. Data about exhaustible resources can be found in the SEEA accounts. 
In environmental economics, it is often considered that such resources are different from other resources. By nature, they are limited in quantity and cannot be regenerated on human timescales. By using a unit of resource today, economic agents forego a value that might have been realized in the future. In that case, the normal efficiency condition of a competitive economy does not hold and prices exceed marginal extraction costs by an unobservable amount called economic rent. Theories of optimal depletion attempt to describe the behavior of this rent over time. In a seminal work in 1931, Hotelling demonstrated that the economic rent must grow at a rate equal to the rate of interest. However, this Hotelling rule requires strong assumptions that are often unrealistic. Assumptions such as the complete stock of the resource being fully known, that there are no alternatives to the resource, that the quality of the resource is uniform over time, and that agents have perfect foresight. In PEP1T, it could be more realistic to consider alternative assumptions considering that deposits of exhaustible resources occur in varying grades and that the higher qualities are exploited first. With this in mind, additional equations could be included in the PEP1T. As shown here, equation 1 considers a direct physical relationship between the resource extraction and the output. Parameter A can be easily calibrated with the SEEA data for every non-renewable resource in the economy. Equation 2 considers an inverse relationship between the productivity of the sector using the natural resource and its remaining stock. Within this framework, the smaller the remaining stock is, the more expensive it becomes to extract. Here again, the parameters reflecting the technology of the extractive activity in equation 2 can be calibrated with SEEA data. Finally, equation 3 describes how the stock of mineral resources is updated between two periods based on the stock remaining from the previous period, the extraction by economic agents, and potential new resources discoveries. One last topic that could be relevant for environmentally extending PEP1T is that of land. Land is indeed one of the most important assets provided by the environment to the economy. Among the various environmental issues that can be related to this natural asset, we chose here to focus on a specific one, the allocation of land to different uses. How land is being employed, for instance for agriculture, forestry, natural habitat, etc., is indeed a critical issue in a context of climate change. On one hand, it can be part of an adaptation strategy addressing climate change for many developing countries, given that the expected decreases of agricultural productivity threaten food security and encourage the use of lands for agricultural activities. However, on the other side, it can also be part of a mitigation strategy for countries as using land for forestry or preserving natural forests keeps excess carbon out of the atmosphere, thereby slowing global warming. Conversely, using land for livestock and crops generates massive amounts of greenhouse gases, therefore intensifying global warming. In PEP1T, Land can be considered as an environmental resource, which is assumed to be fixed and divided into different types of land uses, like cropland, pasture, planted forest, and natural forest. Such data can be found in the SEEA Agriculture, Forestry, and Fishery accounts. On this basis, each agricultural activity is assumed to use one of these classes of land, except natural forest, as a primary factor of production. In PEP1T, the allocation of lands between these different agricultural uses can be specified through a constant elasticity transformation function as shown in equation 1. Within this framework, landowners are supposed to maximize the total value of land rents and as shown in equation 2, the allocation of lands thus responds to changes in land remunerations. Given that natural forests do not produce land rent, they cannot be included in the CET function. Moreover, it can be assumed that deforestation increases the quantity of lands that can be used for agricultural purposes. Unfortunately, 
This deforestation cannot be easily included as an endogenous variable in the model, yet it can be considered as exogenous and determines the evolution of agricultural land between two periods, as shown in equation 3. Now it is time to conclude. By their natures, CGE models, like the PEP1T, are able to capture many aspects of an economy, and it is often tempting for developers to implement a lot of different aspects. This temptation is all the greater for environmental extensions, given that many interactions between the environment and the economy can potentially be addressed. Before extending PEP1T, it is necessary to carefully define the specific environmental research question that you want to address and accept that you will not be able to include all other environmental topics. It is also necessary to identify all relevant monetary flows and physical flows between the environment and the economy and be sure that such environmental data are available. After extending PEP1T, it is also necessary to identify specific synthetic indicators for a better interpretation of your simulation results. Such indicators will help you in tracking the progress of the economy with respect to the environment and sustainable development features or for defining policy scenarios and assessing how well these policies are performing. There is a wide range of potentially relevant indicators. Here we only give some examples. Many other indicators are detailed in Chapter 2 in the SEEA Applications and Extensions. One relevant indicator could be environmental intensity indicators. These characterize the intensity with which pollutants and other residuals generated by economic activity flow to the environment. They can be expressed as the ratio of an environmental variable, such as emissions of pollutants and other residuals, to an economic variable such as output income and value added, or alternatively, to population. They can be disaggregated by institutional sector and by industry, as well as by emission source. Other relevant indicators could be resource intensity indicators, which characterize the intensity with which natural resources, including water, energy, and other materials, are used in production and consumption. They can be expressed as the ratio of an environmental variable, such as extraction, supply and consumption of natural resources and materials, to an economic variable, such as output, income and value added. Here again, they can be calculated at the economy-wide level, by industry, by product, by agents, or by type of resource. Other indicators could help to assess whether the economic activity pattern is degrading or depleting available environmental assets. These indicators can be expressed as rates of depletion or degradation relative to the levels of the stock of certain natural resources. Finally, a last example could be to calculate adjusted measure of wealth of the nation, including natural capital. Such an indicator could help to overcome the limitations of standard gross domestic product and thus could be a more accurate measure of well-being. It may be compared with non-adjusted aggregate to exhibit, for example, the extent to which depletion and degradation contribute to the change in gross domestic product over time. Once again, you should remember that there are a lot of possibilities for designing relevant indicators and that your final choices must depend on the purpose of your study.